Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you're connecting from, and welcome to today's webinar with Solar Winds, preserving revenue in the face of COVID-19. What do you do when your customers say they need to cut back or eliminate your support as a consequence of COVID-19? I'm your host today, Colin Knox. I'm the head of community engagement here at SolarWinds MSP. I am the former owner of a fast growth MSP. I uh, was the founder of Passportal and former CEO. And uh, apparently uh, due to popular belief in the person that made this slide, I'm an overall good guy. We'll kick off with a little bit of housekeeping. You will notice today that all attendees are on mute. That's not because we don't want to hear from you today. It's because we want to ensure the best possible audio experience for you all. In fact, we do want to hear from you today. So we ask that you use the questions panel and the GoToWebinar bar to ask any questions and feel free to ask any questions at any time. These webinars are for you and we want to make sure that we get you the advice and answers that you are looking for. Please do let us know if you have any audio or video issues. If you are having some audio issues, it may be better to dial in with the recent load capacity that uh, GoTo has been having. And before anybody asks, this session is being recorded and we will have a copy available for you to review after the session. So as we kick off and with all the content we're doing, I wanted to launch a poll to just Get a, get a gauge and an understanding of what is worrying you the most right now. So if we can get that poll kicked off. Um, you know, what's keeping you up, uh, up at night? Is it still supporting work from home effectively? Is it about retaining your customers? Is it about securing the networks of both you, you and your business and your clients? Uh, is it about maintaining your revenue and profitability? Or is it maybe about retaining your staff? We do want to hear from you. This helps us drive the type of content that we deliver, the topics that we focus on, so that we can make sure we're getting you the advice that you need when you need it. So we'll leave that open a little bit more. I know we're really excited about the content here today. Um, this is our third session of, of this webinar this week here. So hopefully we're a little bit more practiced for you guys today. Um, but really excited to have some great content to deliver on, on maintaining revenue uh, and, and preserving it. So without further ado, I want to introduce today's speaker where you're joined today by Eris Demos ah, sorry, Eris, Eris Demos That's okay. uh, he's a training content manager at SolarWinds MSP here. He's got 16 years of sales and consulting experience in the MSP space, uh, has consulted one-on-one -on -one with thousands of MSP owners, and in fact supported MSPs through the last recession. Uh, we all think he's a little bit funny, but he's uh, he's one of those guys that does think he's a bit funnier than he actually is. So welcome to the show, Eris. <laughs> thank you, Colin. It's true. I'm my biggest fan. Anyway, <laughs> um, thanks, uh, Colin, for 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 that. That's great. And and listen, hopefully everybody's gotten over the wave of setup, um, you know, and support for the work from home movement, and things are settling down a bit now. And if we might change the slide for me. Today's presentation, guys, is all about being prepared, okay? We're, we've not yet had two back-to-back -back quarters of economic downturn, so we're not in a recession at the moment, but the COVID-19 pandemic has created some similarities that lead one to believe we should treat it in the same way, especially as it relates to customers looking to reduce or remove services, right? Not to mention the fact that it may very well end up you know, creating or being the catalyst for a recession in the future. So we want to be prepared for all of these inevitabilities. Absolutely. And so if we have hints of a recession coming or that this, you know, may be a catalyst for a recession, what can we garner? What what can we take that we learned from the last major recession in 2008? Yes. Yeah, so let's start by looking at what happened then and and kind of use that as our baseline right the first thing we learned is that we're all going to get through this as an industry so let's just take a breath and exhale okay now financially though both revenue and profitability were affected in 2008 so from a revenue perspective we dropped about 30 percent in the first year as an industry just like the rest of the world did this was mostly due to clients going out of business or reducing their headcounts or just sort of looking for ways to reduce their price with you guys. So then what ended up happening after that initial uh, downturn was the market stabilized and started to slowly recover. And MSPs recovered very nicely with it. 
On the profitability side, however, there was a difficult thing to maintain for most markets, right? In our space, for example, the product-based companies and the project-based companies took the biggest hits uh, to profitability and in many cases started losing money, while MSPs fared much better staying profitable for the most part. Surprisingly, the break-fix shops maintain positive margins even with reduced revenue because of how closely their margins are tied to their rates. And their profitability did reduce, however, but again, mainly because of those rate reductions. But it is a bit different this time, right? The banks are strong this time, so there should be more access to money through the federal government or through the banking industry, which should help during the and also lead to a faster recovery. It seems like when business is good, you know, companies like to spend on IT, uh, but when things aren't going quite as well, it's it's the first place they look to cut. And so with that in mind, uh, let's get into how to prepare and respond for clients asking for financial relief. Absolutely. So let's uh, take a look at, you know, what, what some of, how we can apply some of those lessons and, and what some of the top things are to consider and to do as you set the stage for beginning to be prepared to, to preserve revenue. Yeah, and you're right. And the first thing you should do is to start thinking about your customers critically, right? You'll, you'll, you'll need to triage them, and that means doing some segmentation work. So have you sorted out which of your customers are your best customers or your most profitable customers? Have you thought about which of your customers might drop and which ones you might want to keep? You know, we'll, we'll work through some of these answers and, and to these questions in the following slides, but the point here is that you need to prioritize your effort in such a way as to minimize your high risk situations with customers, right? And so to that point, you know, looking at the second section there, have you thought about which industries you have in your customer base today? Which are the most likely to struggle and which are the most likely to recover quickly? Like right now, for example, you know, you're seeing restaurants and retail and gaming and, and tourism struggle, for example, right? While, while financial, healthcare, and IT are likely to bounce back a little more quickly. And then finally, have you determined which of your customers will be financially healthy enough to pay now and in the future? Do you have the credit card info in your systems? Are you controlling what you can by ensuring you get your invoices out on time? Have you begun collecting those outstanding receivables? You know, make sure any new services like project work, for example, are built up front wherever possible. And if it looks like some customers are having a hard time to pay or being troublesome payers, then you really need to consider whether or not you should do any work for them moving forward at all. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, this is a great time to really be evaluating all of your clients. Uh, over the years, running a couple companies, one one kind of task that um, I had that was always recurring was to evaluate every employee frequently and, and kind of make that consideration of, is this an employee I would hire back? And if I would hire them back, would I hire them back into the role that they're in? I would flip that right now into the client focus and say, is this a client that I would want to engage with and contract to knowing what I know now? And if so, would it be at the current contract level and with the current scope of services that I'm doing with them now? And if that's a no, um, you know, then, then I think there's some decisions to be made, but that's some of what Eris will get to later. Um, you know, in, in keeping in tune with, with triaging and, and evaluating our clients, I, I, that some of that kind of pairs to the services that we're delivering to them. So why don't you give a bit of a breakdown in there? Yeah, that's another factor to consider, absolutely. Like This shows how each of the different service offerings sort of affect your business, right? You'll notice that the managed and proactive columns on the far right, the ones that we have all been chasing for, for uh, are the most profitable type of customer and the most profitable type of MSP business. They also represent the highest revenue numbers and business valuations. And so what I want you to do is look at look at this maturity model and, and keep this in mind along with what we just talked about in the last chart about triaging and, and segmenting your customer base as we go through this segmenting exercise together. So we could switch slides for me. You there? Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So now having touched on the most important things to, to consider, let's look at how that plays out when you're actually segmenting your base. So 
I suggest you break your customer base down into three segments. Okay, your tier A customers are your best customers. These are the companies that purchased your highest level services typically. They listen to you and trust you when, when you make recommendations. They rarely, if ever, need to be reminded to pay on time and usually pay in full when they do. Like these are the customers that truly understand that your services are an investment into their employees' productivity and therefore they value your services. Okay, so for this reason, they're the least likely to leave you, but that doesn't mean they won't ask for relief, okay? And then your tier B customers understand the need for ongoing proactive services typically, but they see your offering as more of an insurance policy than an investment into their productivity. You know, many of them will, will be good payers, but you may have some that lag behind regularly also in this category. They're likely in a maintenance package that provides you with good, you know, amount of, of recurring revenue, but also have some ad hoc component to it as well, right? And then finally, your tier C customers are everyone else. Like these are the customers that you see, that see your services sort of as a, a necessary evil, right? They know they need you and, and do so. And more generally, they're looking to spend the bare minimum just to get by, right? That, that pushes most of them into that time and materials type, style model most of the time is they wanna spend only what they need and when they need it. Now, regardless of which group you've categorized your customers into, and, and this is just one method of doing so, the point is to categorize them in these groups, it's clear that you're likely going to be forced into making some tough decisions and likely sooner than you'd like. So given how different each of these groups is, it becomes pretty obvious that you should not apply the same logic to your decision making for each group. So I wanted to look at them individually. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And and even as as they're starting to go through each of these and, and segment your, your customers. So this is just an example of a way that you could segment and, and triage and break down your customer base. There's there's many other ways, but um, you know, when you're looking at this, you may be evaluating some customers that are in the tier B level, but that are almost at a point where you could move them to a tier A um and and vice versa so it's, it's really looking at what you've got there so let's dig in and and take a look at what some of the strategy would be for the tier a customers eris yes yeah, so let's uh, starting there like i said before these are your best customers and likely your highest level program customers so the truth is there's a limited number of these customers in the market okay but they happen to usually represent the bulk of your recurring revenue so the other thing to keep in mind at this level is that it's usually quite difficult to get these customers back into your highest level offering if they've spent an amount of time in a in a lower model or a different model and gotten by with that model, right? So rather than change their model, um, what you need to do is bend for them and meet their current budgetary requirements on a contractual understanding that that contract will resume after some agreed upon duration. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it's important to point out, you mentioned that there's this finite number of those tier A type customers in the market, but they do exist. And there could be actually a little bit of opportunity for growth in that, uh, which we'll, we'll get to a lot later in the presentation today, but that's interesting. And then looking at, at the revenue representation, I mean, this really does start to pose that, uh, that, that 80-20 rule there, where 80% of your revenue is coming from 20% of your customers. And um, I think the nice thing to recognize is the likelihood is, is that the tier A uh, customers and that 20% are your most profitable as well um, in most cases. So I think we've got some clues of how we can use that and leverage that profitability um, as you move into the actual strategy here. Absolutely. Now, so that given that these are your best customers and that they are in the minority of potential clients, like we just said, and, and Colin reiterated as well, I'm going to make the assumption here that everyone on the line wants to keep these customers during and after this is passed. Uh, would you say everybody's probably nodding right now, Colin? I, I'd say you've got a, a, a very strong contingent that concurs with you. <laughs> right, okay, so that leads me perfectly and directly into my second assumption, which is that you must be willing to give up a little bit more in the short term to ensure they stay with you in the long term. Okay, so that means getting creative when they come to you asking for some relief during the crisis. Okay, now the first thing I'd like you to think about is rather than start by offering a discount, 
offer them a deferred payment option where you can provide them some relief now, but still get paid for your services later in full, right? So for example, knocking about, I don't know, whatever, 500 bucks off a $3,000 a month bill and adding it to a later bill later might really be all they need from you. So there's no reason to go to the next step if you don't have to. Now, if that doesn't meet their needs, if the deferred payment option isn't going to work for them, then offer them a straight line discount for a predetermined amount of time and try to make that amount of time as short as possible and obviously try to make the discount as small a percentage as possible and then reassess the situation again as you approach the end of that period. Then adjust those contracts with this new language and get a signature so that it's easier to get them back into where they were before this all started as well. And then finally, the other thing you can do is offer other components of your offering that might have a, a charge associated to them for free, right? Like, like in our example here, after hours support. Um, again, that'll be for a period of time. Now, uh, we oh, sorry, go ahead, Colin. Well, I was, you know, I think there's there's just a couple of things. One, I think the staged approach is is very wise. And again, these are examples of solutions, but. The one thing to note is that you shouldn't give your clients something that they're not asking for in this case, right? There's a lot of times we try to, to you know, really demonstrate value, really give great, uh, um, you know, bang for the buck. But starting out with a payment deferral defers revenue; it doesn't doesn't cannibalize revenue, and I think that's a great thing. And when you then um, when you're doing that deferral. Don't don't start to offer something one unless somebody asks for two, it and two until you understand what the level of the ask is. So don't look to defer or even discount, you know, five hundred or a thousand or, or dollars or or thirty percent even, if all that they may need is ten percent that they're asking for, right? Because we have to remember that they're asking for this across those that do ask are asking for it across their entire vendor and supplier base. Um, so, so be cognizant of that, that you're only to play a small part in the greater relief that they get. The next thing though on this post hour support for free and other tactics and, and, and uh, things like that is something that we'll actually be touching on uh, in more detail in next week's webinar, another webinar we're putting on that's about operational priorities for MSPs during COVID-19. Um, so if you haven't gotten that email yet, please do check for it, keep your eyes open for it. Uh, if we do have the registration link handy, we will pop it in the chat uh, of this webinar for you. But but uh, overall, I, you know, continue that staged approach. Uh, Eris, did you have anything else on this one? Yeah, last thing, and, and those are great points, right? We obviously don't want to be handing out discounts where none are asked for. But regardless of which method of relief you choose for these customers, there's one thing you're going to have to do, right? And that's combat that. You're going to need to increase your efficiencies in order to maintain those margins and profitability levels. So Absolutely. that leads, yeah. That, so that leads into the next slide perfectly here. Absolutely. Let's drill in and, <laughs> and see how we can look at driving those efficiencies that maintain or in some cases can even improve margins in a situation like this. Right. Now, and so driving efficiencies, you, you can do in three key areas here, right? The first is to drive down labor costs in your service delivery model through automation. Now, we've been pushing this message for quite a while now. And if you've already done some work here, you're going to be in a better shape than some of your other MSP colleagues out there. Now, if you haven't, there's really no time like the present to get started on this. So our head automation nerd, uh, Marc-Andre Tanguay, um, has been delivering automation boot camps and office hours sessions. The boot camps are like two day uh, training sessions. The office hours are question and answer periods live where anybody can go in and ask him automation questions and how to help uh, get an automation thing created, uh, policy created. And these are designed to help get you to the next level, no matter what that next level looks like for you. So you can register for any of those head nerd uh, boot camps, not just his, and any of the office hours from any of the head nerds on any of our topics. And I'll just quickly pop that into the chat right now for you here. Here's a couple of links. Um, that didn't work. Why didn't it work? All right. I will do so uh, as as Colin is speaking in in, in for in the next uh, section that he gets. Um, and, and we'll pop those in there so that you guys can go register for those, okay? The second area to focus on is your timekeeping and documentation process. These are things you can control fully, 
right? And you already own the tools to ensure you minimize your effort while maximizing your effectiveness in this area. So start streamlining these processes as soon as possible. And the third is basically staffing, right? Staffing more efficiently to maximize profitability. Now that may mean staggering shift work to, uh, for better coverage, or it may be a more clever delineation of responsibilities and or workload. But either way, you need to leverage the human resources you have more effectively starting right now, okay? You have control over all three of these things. No outside force can get in the way of becoming more efficient unless you let it. So double down Absolutely. and make sure you, you know, your, your, cre your creative discounting is really only matched by how efficient you make your business. Yeah, and, and, and these are there's a lot of resources that we've put together and a lot of programs that we have running, uh, like Eris already said, across the boot camps and office hours with the nerds, uh, educational content and webinars. Um, something that we are looking at creating is some virtual work groups with uh, industry leaders that can facilitate those work groups. So if that's something that you would be interested in participating where you've got, you know, 15 or so members participating in a work group, um, get some peer feedback, peer advice, peer sharing. Uh, in the question panel of GoToWebinar, just type in, I'm interested in work groups. Um, and then as we um, get that a little bit more baked out and as we get them put together and, and uh, assign the industry leaders um, for facilitation, we will be sure to reach back out to you. So just drop, I'm interested in the work groups and the, and the questions uh, panel, and we'll be sure to get back to you with more information about those. Um, so that was really good information, Eris, about a tier A strategy and, and margin management there. Let's dig in a little bit on, on what that strategy looks like for the tier B customers. Yeah, and, and hopefully, thanks, Colin. And hopefully everyone sees value in that and they're typing into the question panel uh, as I speak here. But since your tier B customers are your next level customers, um, we'd like, yeah, we'll likely want to start actually finding a way to support them while still remaining profitable, obviously, right? So discounting at this level shouldn't really be the approach though, right? They don't value your services quite as much as the tier A's do, and there are more of them out there as well for you to capture. So instead, you should focus your level of support to be commensurate with the level of pay they can afford. Okay, so the answer here when asked for relief is to move them down that program level, unlike the tier A's, right? If they are, for example, a proactive customer, most of the revenue you gain from them will be contractual recurring revenue, and a smaller portion will be from ad hoc services. So the move here, therefore, is to reduce the contractual revenue by as little as possible, of course, by offering uh, a substitution with an a la carte bundle that supports their base requirements while still providing them with some relief, right? So you might end up going from, say, a $600 a month proactive program to say $400 a month in a la carte line items that cover the absolute necessities for that customer, okay? And at the same time here, it's important to note uh, one other thing in that it is important for security and the security landscape in today's market, uh, you know, to be brought up, right? It's, it, it's almost irresponsible for you to not maintain at a minimum some security for all of your customers, right? So this is different than the 2008 recession. You must now protect yourself and your clients. And so whatever that fallback position becomes, whatever the group of line items is in a la carte or, or wherever we're falling back to, to meet their budgetary needs, you have to include these types of security services in that response. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a couple important things to note. One, when you're talking and looking at moving uh, a tier B customer down a program level, um, I'd like to highlight that when you're moving them down, you are actually relieving the level of service and, and the amount of resources required to deliver that service to them, which makes it a lot easier for you. But you are preserving revenue, yet you're also freeing up additional capacity on your team and with your services and other stuff. So it actually gives you opportunity um, to go out and, and potentially fill that additional capacity with new clients and new opportunity. Maybe some of those other tier A customers that are out there right now. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more opportunistically about growth and revenue replacement rather than preservation a little bit later in this in this program. Um, you know, the other thing to hint on there, you mentioned 
Eris, about having a minimum level of security. And, and this is important, this is vital. When you look back to 2008, we didn't have the same type of security threats. The threat landscape has evolved so drastically and significantly over the last 12 years that now we're in a place where with disparate solutions and, and SaaS applications, um, you know, with, with all of these employees that are now working from home that didn't happen during the financial crisis in 2008, you're now no longer providing security within four walls. It's expanded much further beyond that, and there's much more intelligent attack vectors. We did a webinar last week um, on, on securing and supporting remote users and work from home users. And Eris, if you can drop that one in the chat window for everybody, a, a link to the recording of that. Our head nerd on uh, security, Gil Langston, did a brilliant presentation on the evolved threat landscape, the different attack vectors that you need to be considerate of, and then the layered security approach to take on to secure those, those clients. This is one of those times where you may be taking on some additional risk and liability when it comes to revenue concessions and, and contractual concessions you're making with clients, but this is not the time for you to take on additional risk and liability when it comes to security, because that's just not reasonable to put that on you. Um, so you do need to make sure that your clients are able to maintain that, that level of security still, uh, which I know we'll get a little bit more to and how we could put that together. Um, but Eris, when you talk about stepping down a program level, that would mean that um, the MSPs need to have the right breakdown of service offerings and programs. So how about we jump into what that looks like and, and uh, talk through that? Yeah, and this is just a high level overview. Uh, you know, the line items may be a little different for different people, but these are the most common sort of line items at each pro uh, at each program level that we see across our customer base, okay? And so what you're looking at here, for, for some, you know, getting a full complement of offerings may mean that they need to build an a la carte program offering now. Okay, the, your your a la carte offering typically will include line items that are both needed by customers and highly automatable by you because what you're providing is just the deployment and ongoing maintenance of these solutions, right? Not necessarily the fixed time associated to any issues that might arise. So the goal isn't just to maintain recurring revenue and value here, but also to do so with as little human effort as possible, which is exactly why the a la carte program is a perfect fit for this situation, right? Because all of the line items are gonna be highly automatable with good margin. Now, having a variety of a la carte line items will mean that you minimize your fallback position with your, your tier B customers because you can cover more of their needs with a bundle. That should, in turn, uh, preserve more of your recurring revenue with these customers. The a la carte program worked really well in 2008 with my partners, as it both maintained service and contract value while simultaneously reaffirming that they need to continue to pay monthly for service, right? It keeps them used to giving you something every month, even if it is a reduced amount. Um, and again, it's just for the time being. So I think that's a great breakdown and that really does show. Now we talked about that minimum level of security that needs to be involved. So how about we take a look again at, at what that looks like? Right, and look, obviously the more security line items you add, the lower your risk becomes, right? But even with a robust a la carte offering, there will be times when you need to fall back further than you'd like uh, with some customers. And in this case, your bare minimum should be these four security services right here, okay? Now, the, again, the more you do with security, the lower your risk. We, so we strongly suggest trying to maintain as many security line items as possible, even when providing relief. But if you can't, this small bundle here should be the line you draw in the sand, okay? So mm -hmm. let's look at what that bundle looks like in a little more detail. So included in the bare minimum must be whatever your preferred endpoint protection solution is, uh, however you do patch, um, whatever your solutions are for mail and web protection. I'm not saying you need to use ours. Everybody's got their own, their own tools out there and that's fine. But these four items specifically need to combine to assist in avoiding both the greatest number of and the most avoidable issues. So my suggestion is this as the bare minimum, the minimum viable product for this. Okay, now looking at the line items, I'll, I'll work from the bottom to the top here. Web protection 
uh, obviously needed because work from home users tend to ignore more than they do at work and may go to this or that site, right? Especially if they're using their own machines rather than company laptops. They feel like they're allowed to because it's theirs, right? Uh, regardless of the fact that they may have proprietary information on that machine now that they didn't have it before. Right? Mail continues to be the more frequent uh, delivery method for malware and the most common entry point for breaches in general, so we need to protect them there. Patch is one of the easiest security issues to avoid, but home users rarely do it, right? And, and endpoint protection is one of those necessities that gets overlooked and ignored by non-technically minded individuals, especially in a home environment. Okay, so for these reasons, it would be detrimental to your customers and unprofessional of you, I guess, to let any of these machines at home, these, these desktops and laptops at home under your watch, go without these items at a minimum. Okay, and it's clearly not cost prohibitive. Okay, you're looking at about 12 bucks a device per month, right, on the low end. So if they have 20 employees, that's about 240 bucks a month, right? Then my cell phone bill is bigger than that, okay? So given that it takes three hours also to clean a compromised machine, three, three and a half hours or so we see, that's a pretty easy ROI in this package, okay? So I can show you how I came up with that pricing. Yeah, and I think, you know, you are showing a few things here, here, Eris. I mean, it's it's not an overwhelming cost. It's not cost prohibitive to the client at $240 a month. And some of the attendees might be looking at this game saying, you know, what's 240 bucks a month gonna do for me? Well, it's it's power comes in the quantity. So when you start looking at applying this across 10 customers, you have $240 that you've gained back, or $2,400 that you've gained back. When you take it up to 20 clients, 30 clients, that you're maintaining this minimum security bundle with, it really does start to add up, um, not just on, on the total revenue uh, recapture there, um, but it can also be extremely profitable, very high margin. So let's jump into how you cost up this uh, solution here and dig in. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Now, here's a screenshot of the costing worksheet. Uh, it's available in the MSP Institute for all of our uh, partners and customers, of course. Uh, I've made it available to all attendees today, whether you're uh, a customer of ours or not. It should be in the handouts section right now here on the, in, your, in your panel. Feel free to download that and use it to take a cost up approach to pricing everything moving forward. What you can see is everything in the gray here is, is editable by you, okay? So what I've added here is a suggestion, an example. Um, your pricing may be different and therefore, you know, your costing and your pricing may be different, uh, but you're gonna take a cost up approach the same way I did, okay? So that what you can see here is that I've added a line uh, bordered in green for my, you know, quote unquote, COVID-19 security bundle. Okay, I've added the cost of an agent. Again, I'm using our prices here because I, I don't know what else you guys are using. It's all I've got. So I've added the cost of our agent uh, to accommodate the patch component of the program, a license of antivirus, which you can upgrade to an EDR license. Some of you, many of you like to do that instead and adjust the price here if you prefer, right, to say $3 instead of one. And then the, the price to the customer up another few bucks as well, and a license of web and mail protection each, okay? So that brings our total software cost to about $5.99. Um, again, the human effort required to support an a la carte program is typically very minimal, so I didn't add any time for that. Then I added the price of 12 bucks, uh, which yields a margin of about 50%, okay? So you can take the calculator and take a cost up approach to pricing any of your pricing, especially new pricing in this climate, um, you know, that, that, that you're gonna go out to market with. Take that cost up approach. Absolutely, so, you know, I think 50% markup uh, or, or margin sounds good to me. I, I think keying in on the 100% markup is where it, it really uh, <laughs> hits home for me, right? I think that's one of those things that, again, speaks to the profitability and where you can find uh, recapture from any concessions that you do have to make. Um, this, the copy of this uh, spreadsheet is available in the handout section of, of uh, GoToWebinar. Uh, I encourage you to grab it there. You can change the currencies in it. You can change it to whatever works for you or the pricing of the different products that you guys use and have access to. I mean, there's a lot in there. Um, like Eris mentioned, with antivirus and AV, it, Bitdefender is one option. If you wanted to, to modify any of these and jump up to an EDR type solution for advanced endpoint protection, 
you can bump that up both your margin and and the uh, total price for for revenue capture there's i mean this is that bare minimum this lowest possible approach to security so feel free to add in things like workstation backup or document level backups look at having in some other uh, core security solutions or mail security additional so i mean there's there's a whole bunch of things that you can add into this to keep driving it up but this was a really good capture and coverage over uh, the tier B's now and, and an overall cost of strategy. Um, let's let's take a look now into that last category of, of customers that we have, those tier C people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I don't I don't think it'll be very difficult for you to, to sell that program to the tier B's, right? That that'll be a fairly easy backstop if if you had to go down to that level, but hopefully you don't have to. Now, turning our attention to the tier C customers, given that they are not your ideal customers in the first place, you'll want to deal with them on your terms, okay, rather than theirs, meaning you will need to be ready to make some hard decisions and even turn some of them away, okay? My, my suggestion with anybody asking for relief in this bucket is to offer them that bare minimum offering that we just outlined because no matter what their financial commitment is, they are likely going to hold you responsible for their security, right? Right or wrong, that's the way they look at it, right? So you're probably all nodding your heads right now because you know who these customers are in your customer base. We've right? all had them. Yeah, exactly, right? They are likely the first customers also to make their intentions known and ask for relief, okay? And so in order to cover your risk, position that core desktop security bundle or whatever we want to call it, and that we just outlined. And if they are unwilling to agree, then I'm gonna suggest that you cut your losses and move on, okay? These these are the most likely customers to not survive, right? If they can't afford $240 a month as a business. Um, and, and if we do fall into a recession, especially, you know, they may not be there to pay their bill when all is said and done, okay? So I know that sounds harsh, um, but I'm only trying to look out for your best interests here, okay? Like, you have to make the hard decisions and you have to have the hard conversations and make sure you're looking out for number one, okay, yourselves, okay? That's, those are the three ways that, that's how I would segment and triage the existing customer base into A, B, and C tiers to help you guys weather the storm. And, and I think that's a lot of great advice, Eris. I mean, with with any of the customers even these tier c ones keeping that base level of security in place so that you're not taking on your liability you can preserve or find recapture of revenue with that at a good margin and and i think with these tier c's um sometimes you got to make those tough decisions and you can can either decide to let them go and and make room for for other better clients to come in um, or if you see that there is a growth opportunity with those customers, I mean, so this may be a time to try to move them up to tier B or tier A, or if they're just not there yet in the business and it makes sense to retain them, you know, one of the words and terms we didn't talk about with revenue preservation uh, is the flip side with cash flow and uh, the impact that accounts receivable has on that. Um, so it may be well and good that a lot of these customers may be using you a whole lot more than they normally do, and, and you could be putting in a lot of hours, but are they going to be able to, and are they going to be willing to pay that bill when it comes due? So another approach that you can look to take here with these guys is to go back and, and look at selling them time blocks. So not going to change the hourly engagement that we have with you, not looking and, and can't really afford to reduce the hourly rate we charge you, um, but we'll be mindful of it and let's do a, a time block so that I'm able to protect my business in the best interests of all of my clients so that I can make sure that when the storm hits, I am as, as mitigated as possible from maybe having to go out of business myself and put all of my clients at risk. So it makes sense to take on the time blocks. Uh, the one administrative recommendation I'm gonna make if you do uh, do time blocks is that you keep the time block income and, and uh, revenue and cash in a different bank account. And then on a monthly basis, you true up with that and you see what the burn down was of what you would be charging that client that month. And only at that time do you pull the equivalent in, in cash over to your regular operating bank account. So um, just something I wanted to point out there. We've, we've talked a little bit about opportunity, taking an opportunistic approach, you know, right setting ourselves for recovery. So let's, dive a little bit into that, Eris, with 
with what the opportunity that recession can bring. Yeah, you're right. It's it's not all doom and gloom, right? At the end of the day. Um, and great advice on the accounting uh, principles there, because it definitely looks terrible on the books when you're rendering uh, service and there's no money coming in. So definitely take his advice if you guys are going to do blocks. Okay, there. Now, there are always opportunities, even in the face of hardships, right? And there is an opportunity here to get lean and come out even stronger as long as you're cutting and improving in the right places, of course, right? So think about it, right? Like you're not the only company that's going to be cutting back, right? So that proposes right there in and of itself opportunity. In 2008, for example, most of the, you know, what we consider the mid-market in our industry, the 60 to 200 seat organizations started dropping staff and started to outsource, right? It may be for different reasons this time, but guess what's going to happen again, right? Executives will be looking to save money wherever they can, and outsourced IT is an excellent place for them to start. They know it's cheaper to outsource and to get an MSP to do it for them than it is to maintain all of their internal positions. And so, I guess the question to you is, do you have a list of prospects in that group? Do you know who the mid-market guys are around you who may be doing exactly this? And are you educating and marketing to them as we speak, right? And if not, you know, getting started to. And on the other hand, on the lower end of the market, not all your competition is going to survive this, right? Do you know who their best customers are? Do you do you know who the tier A's are, the limited number of tier A's that exist in this market? Do you know who they are so that you can go after them? Are you ready to sell them your services? And if you're not taking advantage of these opportunities around you right now, you're looking in too much and not out enough, okay? So keep your eyes open and be prepared because finding good customers is tough. So don't let some rival speak to them before you can. Okay, in action. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, go ahead. That's a powerful statement you're about to make. You know, <laughs> we are practiced. In action during difficult times, what I was going to say, in action during difficult times is not or does not translate into safety, right, at the end of the day. Absolutely. I mean, the, these are the times, again, where that saying of offense is the best defense can really come into play. Um, you know, I've talked to some some colleagues of mine in business and whatnot, and they've seen in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 percent of their revenue just kind of disappear in the flash of a in the blink of an eye. But uh, surprisingly, they've actually been able to replace over half of that in some of these cases. So, I mean, it, it is opportunistic. You need to go on the offensive, but you can't be hard pitching into the market right now. Uh, I ran an MSP during the last uh, last uh, recession, and and we saw you know 25, 30 percent growth year over year still through that, and a big reason is we had co-managed IT clients. We were able to approach and talk to those clients about um, cost savings that they could have by outsourcing the rest of their um, um, services to us in place of their IT teams. Uh, there were other businesses that were looking for uh, co-managed or even outsourced IT, so we hit on those. Um, and then we did have a number of, uh, of opportunistic uh, clients approach us where some of our competitors did did go out of business. And, and we'll see some stats on the next screen here, but continually knowing who's out there and continually being marketing and, and speaking and communicating out into the industry and into your local market um helps you might not be putting it as to talk about all the services you provide in a time like this and and kind of pitching everything but this is where you can use some social proof some some testimonials from clients about how responsive you were in this time how you were able to react and get them working remotely or working from home successfully um interestingly at times like this this is when a lot of businesses out there are ever so more focused on maximizing the return of every dollar that they've spent and and are investing uh, and that includes in their investment in IT services so in good times they may have been willing to you know turn a turn a blind eye to some of the you know poor service or poor uh, experience that they were getting from one of your competitors and now they're realizing, no, I can't tolerate that. I need the best of the best right now. And that's going to be what helps me survive through this. So not necessarily looking to spend less, but looking to maximize their value. So you need to be ready. You need to be positioned and, and facing in the market 
to make sure that these people can come and, and talk to you and take it on. So it is it is an opportunity out there to jump on. Um, yeah, and so one more thing there too. The nice thing too about all of these opportunities, guys, is that once you've collected on these opportunities, they tend to stay with you. Like Colin, when you did this in 2008, those mid-market customers that, that you were that you were scooping up, did they leave you afterwards? Did they rehire staff or did they keep you instead? No, they, they kept us instead. And, and the contracts actually expanded from there when it came to, you know, coming out of the recession, them realizing, okay, all those computers we didn't replace over that period of time, it's now time to get on a refresh project. And you know, leveraging more into into some virtualization technology. Like, they're, it, it, it was very opportunistic for us, yeah. and, and we made a lot of money off of those customers. Yeah, that's exactly what I saw with my customers as well, and and the customers they, they acquired from the other MSPs going out of business stuck with them too. So it was it's a good time. I know it's a terrible thing to say, but it's also a good time to grow, okay? All right. Yeah, definitely can be. So so let's, in conclusion here, let's, let's do a bit of a recap, Eris. Yeah, so... First things first, this is not going to last forever, okay? We said it at the beginning, I'm gonna say it at the end as well. Uh, everybody needs to take a breath, we're gonna get through this as an industry, okay? There's never been a time where MSPs were needed more, okay? Now, I just wanna end with a recap as well and say this, that recessions are a high pressure exercise in change management, okay? And to navigate one successfully, a company needs to be flexible and ready to adjust. Now, I hope, that what we covered here today has given you some good food for thought and helped you be a little more of that, okay? Remember, at the end of the day, that, that you must segment your customer base and align your offerings to them accordingly, okay? But only if, like Colin, you know, iterated before when I was speaking, only if they ask for it, okay? Don't be offering relief where none has been requested. And look for opportunities in your market that are going to exist, like we just came up we just brought up okay this is a time where working on your business and not just in it will be paramount to your successful navigation through these waters okay statistically the bottom 17 percent of the market goes away during recession and the top 10 percent will actually flourish okay so we in the middle will be the guys who survive it so will you be one of these statistics you know where are you going to where are you going to fall in into that category? We just want to help make sure you're not that bottom 17 percent. Yeah, absolutely. Our focus is making sure you're in the 83 percent that either survive and that's okay too, or that you can flourish in this. I mean, it's on the slide there, but the reality is is that the tough times don't last. We will get through this. It's the tough companies that last. Um, so our focus is to partner with you, to support you, to help you, give you whatever advice and guidance we can to get you through this. Um, and, and that's really what our focus is. So with that, um, we're going to enter into a bit of a Q&A period here. So if you have questions, please do get them into the questions panel of the GoToWebinar um, um, sidebar there. Uh, and while we're watching questions come in and start talking to some of those, we are going to jump to a poll. Um, because we like to get an idea of, of was this session valuable to you? Let us know what you thought about the content uh, and it helps to go towards us always looking to improve and, and move forward with uh, more things like this. So as you have questions coming in, I know a question we've seen a lot, Eris, is, you know, we talk about this as an opportunistic time, um, you know, and, and I even mentioned about ways to, or, or about just getting out and being being marketing and messaging into the market, but do you have any advice on, on how they can get that right message given the current climate out there uh, into the market at a time like this? Yeah, I think I think you touched on it uh, earlier, uh, Colin, right? There's there's a couple of, of ways that you're going to do this, right? The one is, is it's an educational marketing approach, right? It's making sure that everybody understands what you can do for them and what they can do for themselves. You've got to take that, that non-sales approach and let them know that you're here to help use that from a marketing perspective. The security story in, in from a marketing perspective as well is gonna be big here because guess what? We're all working from home. You know who's always worked from home? The bad guys have always worked from home and they do it really well, right? And we're all very vulnerable at this moment in time, especially when we've got all kinds of work from home devices going on, trying to connect back to, to the network sometimes, trying to connect the cloud other times, maybe living in the silo others, right? So they yeah. are definitely attacking 
and we need to make sure that minimum viable product that we talked about from a security perspective is in place because of that especially so take that approach as well and i think colin you had you said a really good one the last time i don't want to steal your thunder would you would you talk yeah. about uh, yeah yeah go ahead. so there was a couple of things right so this is a great time when everybody is so tuned into the media everybody's so tuned into what's going on but this is a great time to so, show you know compassion and community involvement so if you have the cycles if you have the availability this is one of those times where participating in your local community and supporting them is 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 uh very valuable whether you're going and getting groceries or or life necessities and things like that and taking them to seniors homes under the banner of your company like that's something that people will take note of and talk about and, and move forward. If you wanted to go out and get crafts and school type uh, supplies and being able to take those to a couple of the local schools in your community who can then um, you know, look at distributing those to all the students and kids that are working from home and doing things like that. I mean, these are all the types of things that, that as your company, you can get clout for and, and, and uh, credit for as you're driving into the community and, and helping people uh, change their lives because all of the business owners and managers and decision makers out there are people just like you. They're all in isolation and quarantine. They're all, you know, responsive to what's going on here and they would all appreciate and respect any efforts that you do that way. Um, you know, there's a couple other questions that have come in. One thing that I do want to remind, we did the security webinar last week. That link is in the chat of this webinar uh, uh, panel today. I uh, highly encourage you to go take a look at that and learn a little bit more about the security dynamic and work from home. Um, the other one is, again, a reminder about the other webinar we're doing next week on operational uh, prioritizing and, and priorities inside your MSP during this COVID-19 uh, period. And actually, somebody brought up a question about government funding and government programs in this time. We're actually hosting a webinar today and another session of it tomorrow. Uh, with an industry expert uh, who's going to be covering the CARES Act uh, and the federal program for uh, small business uh, um, funding and, and grants. So uh, tune into that and, me, and take a look at that. Let me throw that in the que in the chat right now for everybody as well, because um, that's the first one of those is happening this afternoon at two o'clock Eastern. So there's the registration link for the CARES Act uh, webinar right there. That should answer a lot of those questions as well. Perfect. That is great. And again, the this uh, session has been recorded. Uh, it will likely take us a couple days to get it properly edited and, and put up and posted, but we will have it to you here uh, very soon uh, for you to be able to review. Um, I guess uh, I think we've covered pretty much all of all of the questions here today, or so. I want to thank you for your time and counsel uh, throughout this. I want to thank all of our partners and attendees on today's session for coming out, taking the time. We do hope that you found this, this content uh, valuable, and we do look forward to presenting you with more information to help keep supporting you through this period. So thank you very much, and best of luck as you continue to work through everything. Yeah, and thank you too, Colin.